Hey, this is Carmen Van Skoik, and I'm the pastor of Celebrate Church in Missoula, Montana, and this is our YouTube channel. I wanted to thank you for joining us today. It's my desire that today's message inspires you, gives you hope, and encourages you in your walk with God. Enjoy the message. Hey there, I want to encourage you to turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 6, the book of Acts chapter 6. And thank you so much for joining in. I'm so grateful for you to take time to uh, continue with us on this journey through the book of Acts that we've been on since the beginning of the summer. It's been so good, and uh, we've made it to chapter 6 so far. So let's, uh, let's begin reading. We're going to read the first seven verses. But as the believers rapidly multiplied, there were rumblings of discontent. The Greek-speaking believers complained about the Hebrew-speaking believers, saying that their widows were being discriminated against in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve called a meeting of all the believers. They said, we apostles should spend our time teaching the word of God, not running a food program. And so, brothers, select seven men who are well-respected and are full of the spirit and wisdom. We will give them this responsibility. Then we apostles can spend our time in prayer and teaching the word. Everyone liked this idea and they chose the following. Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit. Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas of Antioch, an earlier convert to the Jewish faith. These seven were presented to the apostles who prayed for them as they laid their hands on them. So God's message continued to spread. The number of believers greatly increased in Jerusalem, and many of the Jewish priests were converted too. Acts 6 begins with a problem. (laughs) What do you think about problems? Do you like them? If you're thinking, well, who likes problems? Can I suggest that it all depends on if it's a good problem or a bad problem. Do you know the difference? I googled good jokes about problems and there were a few that were worth sharing. <laughs> did, for, for example, did you know that the problem with kissing a perfect 10 <laughs> is how cold the mirror, mirror feel, feels on your lips? <laughs> how about the problem of working in IT? If everything works fine, Well, the boss wonders what he's paying for. (laughs) And if something breaks, well, the boss wonders what he's paying you for. My wife says, I can't solve my own problems. And I'm just wondering if someone could help me prove her wrong. (laughs) Only in math problems can you buy 60 cantaloupes and nobody asks what in the world is wrong with you. And one last one, it's about politics. The problem with political jokes is that sometimes they get elected. Back to problems. If you're going to have problems, I'd prefer good ones. And Acts 6 begins with a good problem. The early church was growing very fast. In fact, they were growing so fast that it was actually a problem and people began to start complaining. Which brings me to this statement. I really don't mind complaints as long as you're willing to be part of the solution, not add to the problem. Anybody can see problems. I mean, the biggest problem in our church is this guy you're looking at. I'm full of problems. I just don't dwell on them. The more people an organization has, the more problems that organization has. It's a fact. It's like the guy who said this about marriage. Being married is solving problems together. (laughs) Problems I wouldn't have if I were single. I love this story, though. You see, in Acts 2, God gave the church the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit came, everything changed for the church. God's Spirit set those 120 believers on fire. And they became filled with God's Spirit, and they were never the same. And so before Acts 2, the believers had doubts about themselves. After the Holy Spirit, their doubts turned into great convictions. Before Acts 2, the the apostles kept a low profile. But after the Holy Spirit came upon them, they took the message of Jesus Christ to the streets and the town squares. 
Before Acts 2, they struggled with the right words, what to say. But after the Holy Spirit came upon them, they spoke words given to them by God himself. Acts 2 is when the church became powerful. Acts 2 is when the church was set on fire. Acts 2, the day of Pentecost, is when the Spirit was unleashed upon his people. Acts 2 is the day the church found its power, but, and don't miss this, Acts 6 is the day the church became effective. The church became effective, I say that, because others got involved. The church had a problem. The apostles had been praying and teaching the word. And before Acts chapter 6, these apostles were also <clears throat> making sure the widows were being taken care of, getting their fair share of the food that was distributed. But at some point, everything they were doing was more than what they could do, and balls were being dropped. And so the 12 called a meeting. And here's what they said, and I'm paraphrasing. We are the ones the apostles said, that need to pray and teach the word. But there are others that can take on things that we should no longer be responsible for. So they had a meeting, and in that meeting, seven were chosen to take on that responsibility. And that day, the church got better and more effective. Listen, church, let's apply this to us. There are things that I can do as your pastor the question isn't, can I do them, but should I do them? You see, there are things that Stina can do. She's actually more gifted than I. She's amazing. There are things that every one of us can do, but we are now at a place with the growth that we've had that there are things that some of you shouldn't do and, some of, and, and there are things that every one of us should do, must do. Why? Because you're the best choice. Let me give you an example. This past week, I had breakfast with someone in our church, and uh, I thought before this conversation that he was a people person. And I felt prompted uh, just to ask a question because I kind of took him as a people person, an extrovert, someone that enjoys crowds and interacting with others. But that morning, I felt like God was asking me to ask him the question, do you prefer working with people or technology? And without question, almost immediately, he said with a smile on his face, I prefer technology. So here's what I know. He should not be part of our greeting team. <laughs> The best place for him is not at the front doors of our church on Sunday morning. He can do it. In fact, he has done it. But we have others like Caden and Russell who get jacked and energized about the possibility of connecting with people as they come in through the front doors of our church. They smile and interact with them. They are without question the right people to be the very first people you see when you walk into our church. And so it's part of my job to help you realize what your gifts and talents are, what brings you joy, and where you can make a difference serving in our church and in our community. And when you start doing that, several things happen all at once. And the first is this, and it's the most important. God gets glorified. God gets glorified when you get involved and start making a difference in the church using your gifts and your talents. God gets glorified. The second is you start experiencing joy and fulfillment like you've never experienced before. Our church becomes more effective. And as a result, others will want to experience the same thing that you are experiencing as you've become more involved and you've experienced joy and fulfillment. And don't overlook this one. When you join the team, the team just got better. I say that because the old adage is true. Two heads are better than one. We get better when more people are involved. This past Wednesday, we experienced a crazy wild 
powerful storm. There are still thousands of homes, as well as many businesses that are still without power in Missoula. I just read yesterday that over 1,000 trees in Missoula were lost. In Missoula alone, there are 22 tree crews. 22, think about that. There are also 35 power line crews. That is crazy to me. And they are working as, as much as they possibly can to restore power to those that don't have it. 22 tree crews and 35 power line crews. That's an incredible number. And I know the number is false. And here's why I say that. Thursday morning, I went and bought a chainsaw. I have only used one for about 10 minutes before Thursday, my entire life. But there was a large branch that was covering the sidewalk of, of a, a home, just two doors down. And I was having a conversation with our neighbor and I said, you know, I'll go ahead and remove that tree because the owners of the home, they just bought the home about a month ago and they don't move in until the middle of August. And in my mind, it wasn't acceptable. It wasn't the best case scenario to wait until they come and then they arrive and they see this branch that's been down for a month in front of their home. And so I said, I'll remove it, to which she replied with a big smile, thank you. And so now I own a chainsaw and I started trimming the branches and something absolutely amazing happened, happened and it was rather unexpected. As I started, another neighbor came up to me and said, I'll help. And then two more showed up with the chainsaw and then two more showed up to help. And then another one came just a few minutes later. And here's what I know. This was happening all over Missoula. Neighbors were coming together. People were responding to a crisis and they were making a difference. They were joining a team, a tree cleaning team, if you will. So that's why I say 22 is not the right number. There were way more than 22 teams clearing trees all over Missoula. The storm brought people together. And now I know several new neighbors because of a problem. And together, we became part of the solution. So it's timely today, this message, because we have a problem of sorts. It's a good problem, one that we've had now for several months. We've outgrown the space we are in. And in two weeks, we begin meeting at Westside Theater. I've already posted on our social media the address, and I'll do that again. But moving has created a new challenge. We need help. And so let me say it a different way. We need your help because what we don't need is a bunch of one man bands. <laughs> Are you familiar with one man bands? Let me paint the picture. One man bands are, are done in such a way where there's a drum and then attached to the drum is an accordion. And then on top of the drum is a horn. And the one, band, one man band has figured out how to play all three of these together at the same time, creating music. But you know what you won't find? You won't find one man bands with Grammys. They don't go on to win awards. Why? Because they wear themselves out. The band that wins Grammys, well, they have specialists. They have a lead singer, and in many cases, that's all the lead singer does, sings. They have a lead guitar player, and that lead guitar player specializes in playing lead. They have a bass guitar that specializes in rhythm. They have a keyboardist who specializes at tickling the old ivories and the percussionist. Oh, the percussionist, I love a good drummer that keeps the rhythm, sets the tempo, and when you put them all together, it's amazing music that no one-man band can compete with. And that's exactly why one of our core values here at Celebrate is that we do nothing alone. Because doing life alone is actually dangerous. Get yourself in a life group. Surround yourself with people who love Jesus and love you too. Here's why. Doing life alone is the hardest way to live. You need people and people need you. One man bands 
aren't successful. And one-man bands don't belong in church. And so here's the question. What's your specialty? What are you especially good at? Are you good at noticing things? Because we need some ushers. We've never had ushers before, quite frankly, because we didn't have enough people. And then when we had enough people, we didn't have enough space or room in, in the, in the uh, current space we are in to actually add to the room ushers. But I need detail, detail people who see things others don't see. And you'll take care of people in our worship space. We need a group of people who will help people park. You won't drive their cars, but you'll direct people to where there is space. And then you'll greet them, recognize if they are new, and take care of them in the absolute best way possible. This team doesn't exist right now either, but we desperately need a parking lot team. We need people to serve the children of our church. If you love children, you need to be on our children's team. It's been Stina and Michael up to this point, but we need a team of specialists that love children. We need people who love technology. You may love computers or controlling lights or mixing the music team, and you're thinking we already have people doing that. Let me remind you, we cannot function best as one-man teams. We need teams of people to create the greatest chance of success. We have teams that I haven't even mentioned, and there are teams that we haven't even thought of. And as your pastor, I'm asking that if you see a need, well, let's have a conversation. And in having that conversation, we get better. Let's be more efficient and more effective as we continue to reach people for Jesus. I love verse 7. Let me read it again. Because after the church became more organized, after the church added more people, to, the, to, the responsi to have responsibility of what to do in the church, here are the results. So God's message continued to spread. The number of believers greatly increased in Jerusalem, and many of the Jewish priests were converted too. I want to end <clears throat> with scripture found in Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Ecclesiastes was written by Solomon, who was described in the Bible as the wisest person that had ever lived. Listen to the words that he wrote. Two people are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone, well, he is in real trouble. Likewise, two people lying close together can keep each other warm, but how can one keep warm alone? A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. I love that. Two is good. Three is even better. Let's get better. I invite you, if, if your only connection with a church is watching a video online, you're missing out. You need to find a group of people to connect with. And if you're just gone today and, and, and uh, you're not part of our service, but you're staying connected, I just want to let you know I sure miss you today. And I'm grateful that you call me pastor. And I'm grateful that you are a part of our church. And these next two weeks for us as a church are going to be absolutely amazing. Next week, we have at least 18 people that we're going to be baptizing down at McCormick Park. It's going to be an incredible day. And the following week, we begin meeting in our brand new space. Make sure to watch our social media channels to stay connected. Thank you so much for joining today. How are you, Olivia?